Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we saw that for systems that have more than one electron, we're unable to determine the exact wave function. Instead, we approximate the wave function using a trial wave function, which we represent using the symbol phi. As we saw in that video, if we use a trial wave function for helium, composed of a product of two hydrogen wave functions, we can use it in the Schrodinger equation. When we do, the energy we calculate is very close to the actual energy. But we also found out that the calculation predicts that Z, the charge on the nucleus, is 27 over 16. But wait, we know that the atomic number of helium is 2. Why do we get a number smaller than that? To explain that, we need to remember something we learned back in video 22. Back then, we saw that the nuclear charge experienced by electrons in the atom is lower if there are other electrons closer to the nucleus. For example, we looked at a lithium atom and saw that the inner electrons shield some of the nuclear charge from the outer electrons. In that video, we estimated that the outer electron would see an effective nuclear charge of only positive 1, because the two inner electrons shield two of the positive charges on the nucleus. But actually, the situation is more complicated than that. As we saw in video 18, the probability of finding an electron at various distances from the nucleus is given by this plot. As we saw back then, a 2s electron, seen here in pink, has a significant probability of actually being closer to the nucleus than a 1s electron. That's a very significant fact. It has a substantial impact on the effective nuclear charge seen by different types of electron. For example, it means that the effective nuclear charge seen by a 1s electron is actually lower than we might expect because it's partially shielded by 2s electrons. So, how do we determine the effective nuclear charge really experienced by an electron? Fortunately, there's a great way to estimate the effective nuclear charge experienced by the electron. It was developed by John Slater, who we first met in video 20. Slater came up with a series of steps we can use to find the effective nuclear charge. They're known as Slater's rules. Let's look at how they work. For example, suppose we had a neodymium plus 3 ion. Let's say we want to know the effective nuclear charges felt by four different electrons in that ion. A 1s electron, a 3p electron, a 3d electron, and a 5s electron. We'll use Slater's rules to figure out the effective nuclear charges, which have this symbol Z star. The first step is to write out the electron configuration of the atom or ion, which we learned to do in video 21. We can do this most easily by looking at the periodic table. Neodymium is down here at atomic number 60. That gives us an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6s2, 4f4. But remember, we're looking at a neodymium plus 3 ion, not a neodymium atom. That means we need to remove 3 electrons. You might think that we'll just take the three electrons away from the last orbital, the 4f one. But if you take a course in inorganic chemistry, you'll find out that this would be incorrect. Instead, it turns out that when an atom loses electrons to form a cation, the first electrons to be lost are from the highest s orbital. So in this case, we'll lose both electrons from the 6s orbital. Once we lose those, then we do take any further electrons from the last orbital in the electron configuration. So we'll take the last electron from the 4f orbital. That leaves us with this for the electron configuration for the neodymium plus 3 ion. The next step in Slater's rule is to place the orbitals in the configuration in the order according to the principal quantum number. That means the 1s orbital is still first, then the 2s and 2p orbitals, 
then all the orbitals that start with 3, then all the ones that start with 4, and so on. For each principal quantum number, we still put the s orbital first, then the p orbital, and then the d, and then the f. Slater's rules also tell us that we should group the s and p orbitals together for each quantum number by putting parentheses around them. Now that we've done that, we're ready to start thinking about the electrons we're interested in. You might remember that we want to know the effective nuclear charge felt by a 1s, 3p, 3d, and 5s electron. The next rule tells us that for each electron we're interested in, the other electrons in the same orbital, or group of orbitals if it's in parentheses, each shield 0.35 units of charge. Let's see what that means for the four electrons we're working with. We'll symbolize the shielding using the letter s. For a 1s electron, there's just one other electron in the orbital, so it shields 0.35 units of charge. A 3p electron is in a group containing two 3s electrons and five other 3p electrons, so these shield a total of 7 times 0.35 units of charge. A 3d electron is in an orbital with nine other electrons, so these shield 9 times 0.35 units of charge. Finally, a 5s electron is in a group containing one other 5s electron and six 5p electrons for a total shielding of 7 times 0.35 units of charge. The next rule is a little different depending on what kind of electron our target electron is. If our electron is in an s or p orbital, then every electron whose principal quantum number is one lower shields 0.85 units of charge. Let's try that on our electrons. There are no orbitals lower than the 1s orbital, so this doesn't affect our 1s electron. However, there are eight electrons that have a principal quantum number one lower than the 3p electron. So these contribute 8 times 0.85 to the shielding of that electron. Next is the 3d electron, but we don't use this rule if the target electron is in a d orbital, so we'll move on. There are 21 electrons with a principal quantum number one lower than the 5s electron, so these contribute 21 times 0.85 to the shielding of that electron. The next of Slater's rules also only applies when our target electron is in an s or p orbital. It says that every electron with a principal quantum number two or more lower than the target electron shields one whole unit of charge. Let's apply that to our electrons. Again, there are no electrons with quantum numbers lower than one, so this rule has no effect on the 1s electron. There are two electrons with a quantum number two or more below the 3p electron, so these shield a total of two units of charge. The 3d electron isn't affected by this rule, so we'll move on to the next electron. There are 28 electrons with a principal quantum number two or more below that of a 5s electron. So these shield a total of 28 units of charge. Well, so much for the target electrons that are in s or p orbitals. What about target electrons in d or f orbitals? Those are taken care of in the next of Slater's rules, which says that Every electron in the configuration to the left of a d or f target electron shields one whole unit of charge. If we look at the 3d orbital, we can see that there are 18 electrons to the left of it, so these shield 18 units of charge. The next rule tells us to calculate the total shielding for each electron. For the 1s electron, that gives us 0.35. For the 3p electron, we get 11.25. For the 3d electron, we get 21.15. And for the 5s electron, we get 
38.3. Now we can find the effective nuclear charge felt by each of the electrons. The effective charge is just the charge on the nucleus minus the shielding. Neodymium has an atomic number of 60, so that means the effective nuclear charge is 59.65 for the 1s electron, 48.75 for the 3p, 38.85 for the 3d, and 21.7 for the 5s. As we might expect, the effective nuclear charge is lower as we move to electrons with higher principal quantum numbers, because these are further from the nucleus on average. However, unlike our earlier, less sophisticated model predicted, the 1s electrons actually don't feel the full charge of the nucleus. Again, that's because it's possible for electrons from other orbitals to briefly move even closer to the nucleus and therefore shield some of the nuclear charge from the 1s electrons. And now that we know about Slater's rules, we can finally understand the result that we got in the last video. In that video, we saw that our trial wave function predicted that helium would have a nuclear charge of 27 over 16. To understand that, let's see what Slater's rules predict for the effective nuclear charge on a 1s electron in helium. Rule 1 tells us to write the electron configuration. For helium, that's very easy. It's just 1s2. We can skip rule 2 since we don't need to rearrange the order of the orbitals. The next rule tells us that the other electron in the 1s orbital shields 0.35 units of charge. There are no orbitals with a quantum number lower than 1, so we can skip the next few of Slater's rules. So the total shielding is 0.35. Since the atomic number of helium is 2, that means the effective nuclear charge is 1.65. Let's compare that to the prediction for Z we got in the last video. 27 over 16 is equal to about 1.69. That's very close to the effective nuclear charge that we get from Slater's rules. And if we think about it, that really makes sense. The variable z we have in the Hamiltonian tells us the positive charge on the nucleus felt by the electron. But what the electron feels is the effective nuclear charge, not the actual charge on the nucleus. So it makes good sense that the value we got for z was actually less than 2 for helium. There's one more thing I want to mention today. In the last video, we talked about trial wave functions, and we saw that one reasonable trial wave function is a product of hydrogen wave functions, one for each electron in the system that we're looking at. However, this can be a very challenging calculation. As we saw in some other videos, here are a couple of hydrogen wave functions, one for a 1s electron and one for a 2p electron. Equations involving wave functions like these are actually very time-consuming to solve, even for a computer. For that reason, we don't always use a product of hydrogen wave functions as our trial wave function. So what should we use instead? Well, that's kind of where research becomes an art. A researcher will use their past experience to decide what kind of trial wave function will give the best balance between the accuracy of the wave function and the time it takes to perform the computation. In general, calculations using more accurate trial wave functions take longer. So one other popular type of trial wave function is a sum of Gaussian curves. You might remember from several earlier videos that Gaussian curves are the familiar bell-shaped distribution. If we look at the shape of a Gaussian curve as compared to a hydrogen wave function, you can see some significant differences. First, unlike the curves for the 2s and 3s electrons, the Gaussian curve never has nodes. But the nodes are important structural elements in the shape of a wave function. So the fact that a Gaussian curve lacks these means that a trial wave function made of Gaussians will be less accurate than a trial wave function made of hydrogen orbitals. 
So why would we choose to use Gaussian curves anyway? Well, the main reason is that Gaussian curves can be calculated much more quickly. That makes them very attractive, especially for large systems where a trial wave function made of many hydrogen orbitals would require a very long calculation. Aside from a product of hydrogen wave functions, or Gaussian functions, another common kind of trial wave function is a product of what are called Slater-type orbitals, or STOs. These were again named after John Slater, who came up with this type of trial wave function in 1930. Slater orbitals have this general format, where the symbol here is a lowercase letter zeta. Let's compare the Slater-type orbital for a 2s electron to a 2s hydrogen wave function. Notice what I'm showing here is just the radial part of these wave functions. The angular parts are actually the same for both orbitals. You can see them over here represented by the letter y, which is the symbol we use for the angular wave function in video 17, and also in some earlier videos. As you can see here, the Slater orbital is simpler than the hydrogen wave function, which will make it faster for a computer to perform calculations with it. However, it's more complex than a Gaussian curve, so it won't be as fast as a calculation using one of those. On the other hand, it is more realistic than a Gaussian curve. So, if the system isn't too complicated, a Slater orbital may be preferable to a sum of Gaussians as a trial wave function. So we've seen three different ways of making a trial wave function. We can make them from hydrogen wave functions, Slater-type orbitals, or a sum of Gaussian curves. Those are in descending order of realisticness, but increasing computational speed. So once we've constructed our trial wave function, what do we do with it? Well, in the last video, I gave you an overview of the process we'll use next. We use the trial wave function to solve the Schrodinger equation and calculate the energy of the system. Then we make adjustments to the positions of the electrons and nuclei to account for repulsions between like charges. We then repeat that process many times. In the next video, we'll look more closely at how exactly that's done. It's a process that real researchers use all the time, because as we go through that cycle, the positions of the particles and the energy we calculate becomes more and more accurate. When we talk about that topic, it'll tie together a lot of what we've been looking at in the last several videos, so I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.